the cracks in the U.S. financial system are getting bigger and bigger. Inflation doesn't seem to be slowing down, yet the gold price is in a correctional phase. And uh, my guest is known as Dr. Doom. So mm -hmm. let's see how we can fit this all together. His name is Peter Schiff. He's an economist, a financial broker, dealer, author. Too, too many titles, too many hats, but <laughs> definitely a known quantity in our sector. And I'm really excited to have him join us. Peter, it's great to see you. This is the first time we're chatting. I'm honored that you're coming on SOAR Financially. Oh, thanks, Kai, for inviting me on. You know, nobody's really labeled me with that uh, Dr. Doom moniker in a while. You know, that goes back to my CNBC days in 2005, 2006 timeframe when I was forecasting the 2008 financial crisis and everybody was laughing at me. Uh, they kind of uh, poked fun at me by calling me Dr. Doom. But then after all of my forecasts of doom came true, well, they dealt with it by not inviting me back on the air. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I think it's quite fitting because I, I keep being reminded. Like I, I'm constantly reminded of the movie The Big Short, and whenever I see it, the movie, it's like a carbon copy. It fits perfectly to what's happening right now. Yeah, like, and you know, the New York Times did this article on Nero Rubini, and they labeled him Doctor Doom. And so, when they had the financial crisis, he kind of got that moniker. Even though I was, you know, calling out the crisis before Rubini, and I was a lot more specific about why and, and what was going to happen, so I think I I nailed it better than 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 Rubini did. Even though New, at least Rubini was, you know, not as clueless as almost everybody else. So there weren't that many of us that were around. But you know, I I, I was being called Doctor Rubini before I even knew who. I mean, Doctor Doom before I even knew about <laughs> Rubini. Um, but yeah, and the big short too, I kind of got shortchanged in that one uh, because I was way out in front of the subprime. Uh, you know, in fact, I was, you know, they, they showed in the movie that, um, you know, the, the main characters are going to conferences and in, 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 in the audience. I was on stage. I was I was the one at the conferences telling people that housing was going to collapse and that they should short subprime. I mean, I was talking about this in 05 and 06. I was telling realtors and mortgage brokers, uh, anybody who would listen, uh, what was going to happen to the subprime market. So uh, it, it, it was even you know more dramatic than the way they, they depicted it. History is repeating itself, it feels like, and I wouldn't even call it history because it's only been not even 20 years ago. Yeah. And uh, like I watch a lot of YouTube channels of influencers, they, let's call them that, of people are saying, oh, well, get just get an Airbnb rental and things like that. It just reminds me of the strip club scene in the big short where, where the, uh, the, the stripper says, well, I own five houses and a condo or something and I've got five mortgages going. Right. Yeah, I used to talk about those examples. I, mean, I used taxi cab drivers at the time. This is kind of before Uber. Uh, but uh, I used to talk about how, you know, people were buying houses with zero down and no dock loans and, uh, you know, for years, uh, uh, you know, recognizing that this was a problem. So, I mean, most people just ignored it. I mean, there, there were all these obvious signs that a you know major collapse was coming and that it was a bubble. It's just that most people just close their eyes and refuse to see, you know, what was obvious to, to me or Michael Berry or a few other people could see it. Uh, and the same thing is happening again today. I mean, the bubble that we have now is actually larger than the one that popped in 2007, 2008. But the same people who couldn't see that bubble don't see this one. And they're going to be just as blindsided by the events that are going to unfold. And, you know, these are not like black swans, right? These are ordinary uh, white swans. It's just that, you know, people don't want to recognize the problems. And the, the people who didn't see the 2008 financial crisis coming, they didn't see it coming because they didn't understand the nature of the problem. They didn't understand how Fed policy had created the problem. And it's the same Fed policy that created the bubble in in housing that has created the bubble we've got now. And everything the Federal Reserve did following the 2008 financial crisis to get us out of the crisis just laid the stage for the crisis that's coming, which is going to be much worse because the, the mainstream Wall Street people still don't get that the Fed didn't solve a problem that the market caused. The Fed caused the problem and then prevented the market from solving it by making it worse. And so now uh, the ultimate consequences that we're going to have to deal with in this coming financial crisis will be much worse 
than the, 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 you know, what we would have had to deal with back in 08, 09 had the Fed not intervened and let the market try to repair the damage that the Fed created. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're, we're trending, like it, it is trending that way. I'm looking at the 30 year mortgage rate of six and a half percent right now. And to just, just coming back to the housing topic, it, it seems like the crack is widening because the financial influencers are, and the site hustle Airbnb renters and condo owners, I think, I think they're going to be hitting a wall at some point. Like the question is like, when is that happening? And wh when do you see that happening? And the other question maybe is, is the housing market the trigger that sets it all off again? Well, you already have a big gap between how home prices and affordability based on the six and a half percent mortgage, because the housing market we have now, the prices were built on a foundation of three and a half percent mortgages, not six and a half percent. And there's a big difference in the monthly payments when you're looking at, you know, that higher rate. Plus, it's not just the mortgage payments that have gone up. Look at the cost of homeowners insurance. Those premiums have skyrocketed as well. Also, other costs that homeowners have to bear uh, in maintenance, property taxes, everything about home ownership is a lot more expensive now than it was a few years ago. So the only way to make home ownership affordable for a new buyer is for prices to come down. But the problem when you see a big drop in real estate prices is now you blow up the collateral behind the existing mortgages. And now homeowners don't have the incentive to make their payments when they're underwater on their mortgage, and so they may stop. The only thing that may incentivize people to keep making payments is if they have a 30-year fixed rate loan that they locked in, you know, in the threes, uh, they may not want to give that up. Even though the house itself has no equity, the, the, their, their mortgage payment is still low, maybe relative to rent. But if the house starts to have problems, you know, that need a lot of, you know, expenses, a lot of money, uh, they may not want to do that when they're, you know, putting money into the pocket of the bank because they have negative equity in their home. Because, you know, when you own a home, you can't sell it with the mortgage attached. The new buyer can't assume your mortgage. The buyer has to look at a six and a half percent or maybe in the, in the near future, seven or eight percent mortgage. And that means that they can't pay nearly as much for the house as what you paid if they have similar means. I think that's different in commercial real estate. I learned this week, actually, like you can't assume a mortgage on commercial real estate, but it's not possible on uh, personal real estate and housing. So it, 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 I learned that this week. So I figured <laughs> I'd throw that in there. Um, Peter, like we talked about housing, like, but in, in general, like this is all coming from the inflation debate. And of course, the Fed, the Fed funds rate is and the housing market is the one that screams the most, and it screams the loudest, of course, right now. Um, with inflation being sticky, I mentioned that in my introduction, like what, what kind of options does the Fed have right now? And uh, looking at the Fed watch tool this morning, it looks like we might actually get a, like it's trending slowly towards a 50 basis point hike. Like where do you see things headed here and where's the end? Well, they may hike 50 at the next meeting. I think that's still a you know, low probability they will hike at least 25. That's pretty much baked in the cake. But even then, even if they hiked 50, that would leave the Fed funds rate at five. And even if you believe the government inflation numbers, which I don't, the year over year CPI increase is more than five. I mean, even the PCE, which is an even less accurate way to measure inflation than the CPI, even that is a year over year increase of higher than five. So that means even at 5%, you're looking at negative real interest rates. You can't really fight inflation with negative real interest rates. You need positive real interest rates. You need interest rates that are above the rate of inflation. And we don't have that. And we're not gonna get that because we can't afford it. And also in order to really bring down inflation, you need to see a contraction in credit. And we're not seeing that. We're seeing credit expanding. We have record high credit card debt and record low savings rates. So consumers have not altered their behavior as a result of the Fed rate hikes. They're not saving more and borrowing less. They're saving less and borrowing more. And they continue to spend everything they earn and then some. And that puts upward pressure on prices. And the U.S. government has not cut spending, which is what would be required to fight inflation. 
spending is increasing, and so are the deficits necessary to finance it, which puts a lot of pressure on inflation upwards because now the central banks ultimately will have to do a about face on QE and go back to quantitative easing uh, in order to uh, finance these deficits. Otherwise, long-term interest rates could explode higher if the government needs to finance the debt privately. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize how difficult it is right, to get that inflation genie back in the bottle. You know, there's a reason for that expression, because people learn the hard way. You don't want to let that genie out of the bottle. You know, you go back to the 1970s when we had high inflation. Volcker came in 1980 and, and tried to, you know, put that genie back in the bottle. The Fed never achieved a 2% CPI until 1986. That was six years later by the time the inflation got down to two. And in 1986, you had a Fed funds rate hit a high, I think, of 16% in 1982. Well, we're, we're not even at five yet. So if it took 16% back then to get the inflation rate down to two, and it's not like it stayed at two. The Fed got to a 2% inflation in 1986, and then it took 12 years to do it again. <laughs> All the years between then were way above 2%. So now you have Powell saying, oh, we're going to get inflation back down to 2% and keep it there. Good luck. I mean, the only time the Fed ever achieved multiple years of 2% or lower inflation was during the years that immediately followed the 2008 financial crisis. And those were flukes. And it, this is part of the, uh, the, the, the irony of it. When the Fed lowered interest rates to zero, which was creating inflation, that actually helped push down the CPI because interest is a big cost for everybody. Businesses have interest costs. That's like their raw material costs or their labor costs. And so as interest rates went down for businesses, they were able to pass on the savings to their customers. And so prices were lower because interest rates were, were lower. Also, uh, home ownership, which is a third of the CPI, owner's equivalent rent, that was suppressed by the low interest rates, which kept the lid on mortgage rates, which also kept a lid on rents because, you know, people compete. You can rent or you can buy. And because mortgage rates were so low, that also helped keep rents low. Well, now rents are rising. Mortgage rates are rising. Businesses are having to deal with rising interest rates. And so they're passing that on in the form of higher prices. So paradoxically, what the Fed is actually doing now is making the CPI work higher. It's making it a bigger number because it's actually raising prices. Um, and, and so there's no chance that we're going to get back to 2%. You know, that, 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 that's in the history books. That, those years were an aberration because everything the Fed did to temporarily suppress the CPI back then is now catching up to us and it's all going to push up the CPI. Plus, in the meantime, we have massive amounts of money printing that has taken place. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not going to see 2%. We're probably not even going to see 4%. I mean, the inflation rates will be north of that. And that's even with the fact that the CPI isn't even capturing the real degree to which prices are rising. And that's by design. I, I, the way I usually look at it is whatever the CPI is, just double it. And that's closer to what's actually happening. So if the government says eight, it's probably 16. No, and uh, wage inflation as well, if you believe the, the, the real number or the, the provided numbers is also 4.8% as well. So 2% doesn't seem realistic at all, like anytime soon. Deglobalization as well, a lot of factors going into, into all of it. And to maybe following up on what you said about Volcker as well, it took him six years to get to 2% raising rates in the first, right. the first the, go the around. Right, and the rates were much higher than what we got now. I mean, in fact, the rates were higher than they are now during the 70s with yeah. all the inflation. I mean, we we still have interest rates that we had when we had the high inflation. We haven't, we're not even close to being uh, a contractionary. Yeah. My mortgage broker actually this week mentioned like, Kai, he's like, I had to refinance a small portion of my mortgage, like just, just around, and it, I think it's 3.5%, where in Germany it's a little different, but uh, only 3.5% for 10 years. But he said, Kai, on in historic average, you're still very, very cheap. You're getting still a very cheap rate, right? Yeah. I mean, I remember before the 2008 financial crisis, even during the housing bubble, um, 
these were low rates. And, and a lot of times people didn't want to pay the six or seven percent. So they took a, an arm. They got a teaser rate. And, and before that, before the, the Nasdaq bubble popped, you look at where mortgage rates were in the 1990s. I mean, they were still eight, nine, 10 percent, 11 percent. Of course, you know, during the early 80s, they were 12 percent, 14 percent, you know. I, 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 I mean, 10 percent money was considered you know, cheap. You know, you go back and watch the 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 old Wall Street, and I think that the realtor is bragging to, uh, um, oh, what's his face? Uh, yeah, uh, I, you know, I know who you uh, mean. Bar, like they're sitting to, at the bar to, in Florida. To Bud Fox. And, you know, yeah, she's saying to Bud Fox, "Hey, my 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 friend can get you 10% mortgage or something. Like it's like a really good deal. Like I got an inside track on a 10% mortgage." <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, it, it's it's mind blowing stuff. But whenever I watch that movie, it just reminds me of today's time, right? Um. <laughs> Like interest payments, you mentioned as well. You, you mentioned businesses, but I'm also looking at the government side because at some point we'll hit a trillion dollars a year in interest payments, and that's when it gets political, and that's not too far away in the future. Like no, no you... it's 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 probably this year. I exactly. mean, I think by the end of the everybody wants to act like this is like in the distant future. It will probably happen this year, if not by next year. But it's not just one trillion. Because within a couple of years from then, it'll be two trillion a year in interest on the national debt. You know, and, and to think about that, that's roughly half of what the government collects in taxes. Could you imagine a situation where half your income just is paying interest on your debt before, you know, and then you get the other half to, to live on? And it won't stop there. You know, because the national debt keeps on growing by a couple of trillion dollars a year. And imagine what's going to happen to it during the next recession. Uh, so, you know, let's say in a few years, the national debt right now, the national debt is at um, thirty one and a half trillion. But let's say, you know, 10 years from now, assuming we can get that far, it'll be at least 50 trillion. And if the cost on the national debt is let's say 6% interest, which would still be pretty low, that's $3 trillion a year. <laughs> so, I mean, I, assuming the rates stop going up at 6%, you know. So there's, it's impossible to finance this. This is a powder keg. It is a disaster waiting to happen. You know, every Fed chairman, including Powell, will admit that this is unsustainable. They just don't think we should do anything about it. They just think the time to do something about it is later. You know, the time to do something about it has long since passed. I mean, we're beyond the point where we can actually do something about it. Well, the U.S. debt ceiling as well, like, just sort of comes into discussion here as well, because if you believe some sources, the U.S. might have to default by June. I, I doubt the U.S. will ever default. Don't get me wrong. Like, that would be like waving the white flag. I don't see the U.S. doing that. But well, like, how, how know, does that fit together? Because also, like, and like we can extend this discussion to the you know, the world dominancy of the U.S. dollar as well, because if the U.S. defaults, that all goes away. Well, first of all, we have lived through one default, and that was 1971 when we defaulted on our promise to pay gold for Federal Reserve notes. Federal Reserve notes were IOUs. So if you owned a Federal Reserve note, the U.S. government owed you a specific quantity of gold. So let's say you had 35 Federal Reserve notes, right, a 20, a 10, and a 5, right? You had 35 Federal Reserve notes, that entitled you to one ounce of gold. You could go to the Federal Reserve and say, hey, here's your notes. I have 35 of your notes for dollars. Give me an ounce of gold, which was the dollar, a gold dollar. And so that was a liability. That's why Federal Reserve notes are on the books of the Federal Reserve right now as a liability. Well, if they're a liability, they must obligate the Fed to pay something. That's the definition of, an, of a liability. So what are they obligated to pay? Well, now they're not obligated to pay anything. But up until 1971, they were obligated to pay gold. That's why they were called notes, right? Well, we told the world in 1971, we're not going to give you any of the gold that we promised to pay. That was a default. So we've done it once. Um, so, you know, it's precedent. We could do it again. But even if we don't default on U.S. Treasuries, see, U.S. Treasuries are obligations to pay Federal Reserve notes. Now, at one point, U.S. Treasuries were obligations to pay gold, because if you owned a U.S. Treasury in 1970 and let's say you had, you know, a, a million dollars of Treasuries, the Federal Reserve was obligated to give you gold for that, that 
right? So ultimately, you know, we defaulted on treasuries because we defaulted on the, 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 the Federal Reserve notes, which were the obligations of the treasuries. But now, since uh, the owner of a Federal Reserve note, commonly called dollars, is not entitled to anything from the Federal Reserve or the U.S. government, uh, then we don't have to default on treasuries because we just print money, right? So whatever we owe, the Fed just prints it up and here you go, right? We had a default on the gold because we didn't have the gold and they couldn't just create it out of thin air. They had to go mine it, but the government didn't have it. So it defaulted. But just because they don't default doesn't mean they're paying because let's say the government doesn't have the ability to tax the American public to a sufficient degree to pay off the debt legitimately. They have to resort to the Fed. The Fed has to create the money to pay off the bondholders. The government can't collect it in taxes or they're not willing to cut other spending. Like they're not gonna cut Social Security and cut Medicare and say, hey, we were gonna pay this money out to Social Security recipients, but we need to use it for our bondholders. So we're gonna cut Social Security and we're gonna take the money that we were gonna send to grandma and we're gonna send it to the Chinese, right? So they can get their interest payments, right? If we don't do that, if instead the Federal Reserve just prints up a bunch of money and we say, here you go, right, here's what we owe, the dollar crashes. And so, yes, we give everybody dollars, but those dollars don't have much in the way of purchasing power. So you've got all these dollars, but there's very little that you can buy with them. That's the hyperinflation scenario. We destroy the value of our currency because we have to print so much to pay off our creditors, but then everybody gets wiped out. Everybody who has dollar savings, uh, people who are working for wages, I mean, the, the currency becomes practically worthless, and no matter how many millions of dollars you have, you're still broke. It seems like the writing's on the wall for that scenario to sort of happen, right? So I'm always wondering, like, why is the strength, why is the US dollar still so strong, and why is still everybody looking at America and everything else? like? Like with the writing on the wall, why is gold only at 1838 right now? Like, it's, it's just puzzling. Like, how much faith do you have in the whole system? And uh, like, <laughs> give give me a percentage, maybe. He's like, because because I'm puzzled. Yeah, I know that's the 64 trillion dollar <laughs> question, and I know that when historians look back on this time period, or even when kids in school study this time period, they're going to be asking the same questions. Like, you know, just like we look back at the Salem witch trials and like, hey, how, why were they so dumb? Why did they really believe that these you know, women were witches and, and why were they hanging them? Uh, or you know, we could go back and laugh at the Dutch who were paying all this money for tulip bulbs. Like, what were they thinking, right? So you know, looking back at it, you know, it all looks crazy. But when you're experiencing it, uh, you know, it doesn't seem that crazy to the people that are caught up in the hysteria, uh, you know, the popular delusions and the madness of crowds. And, you know, that's how I would describe this. I mean, we're seeing it real time, too, with things like cryptocurrencies, right? Look at all, all this nonsense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, people have faith in the dollar. They trust the dollar. They believe in the dollar. They're going to be disappointed that, you know, they're, they're going to end up losing a lot of money. Look, just like we started talking about subprime mortgages. A lot of people bought into that nonsense. They own subprime mortgages. They believe the AAA ratings. They thought they were going to get their money back. Now, to me, it was obvious. I was talking about how these securities should have been rated F because they were going to fail. Just, you know, look at my mortgage banker speech on YouTube from 2006. Uh, you know, this was obvious to me. Why was everybody else so clueless? Well, that, that's how they're all clueless now, because U.S. Treasuries, as far as I'm concerned, are subprime debt. I mean, we can't pay any more than, uh, you know, the, the, the subprime borrower can pay. Only difference is we got a printing press. And we'll use it. But that just means the money is worthless when the creditors get paid. But that's the same thing as default. Well, the buying power of the U.S. dollar is diminished anyway. It's already down 97% since 71, isn't it? Like, or 99% even? It's an extremely yeah. High, ridiculous Yeah, well, number. I forget the exact percentage. But certainly if you go back to, to 1913, uh, uh, when we started the Federal Reserve, I mean, the dollar's lost about 99% of its value since then, measured in gold. Because back in 1913, a dollar, you, need, you only needed $20 to buy an ounce of gold, right? So if you had $20, you had an ounce of gold. Now you need over $1,800 to buy that same ounce of gold. So that's a huge uh, decline in the purchasing power of the dollar, you know, over that 100-year time period. But in contrast, if you go back to the 100 years, right, 
before um, the Federal Reserve, the dollar didn't lose any of its value. I mean, it was $20. You, uh, uh, $20 bought you an ounce of gold in 1813, and it bought you an ounce of gold in 1913. And in fact, if you look at the consumer price index during those 100 years, it actually went down. You know, So you, you could buy more with your dollar. Now, try to compare prices today to what prices were in 1913. I mean, stuff that cost a penny back then is, you know, probably a couple of bucks, right? And something that cost 10 cents is, you know, what, I don't know, 20 bucks or do the math. But prices have just skyrocketed over this 100 years. But 100 years of sound money, prices went down. The dollar maintained its value when the government couldn't create it out of thin air. Now, I have to laugh just now, like when you said that $20 used to buy you an ounce of gold, well, now it buys you an ounce of silver, right? So who's the loser now? <laughs> no, not, uh, yeah, but not for long. You know, pretty soon it'll, you need a lot more than that to buy an ounce of no, silver. And we're, we're going to get but to back, that. But back then, silver, an ounce of silver was $1, yeah. right? That's because the silver dollar was about an ounce. No, I just tried to. Be, I thought it was a funny comparison because silver is yeah. trading at a twenty dollars and eighty six cents right now, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but let's talk about it. let's let's forecast a little bit. Like, how are the metals going to behave? And of course, silver and gold are both an alternative to the U.S. dollar, obviously. Um, like, what are you forecasting? What are you looking at? We're thirteen thirty eight in gold right now, twenty eighty six in silver. Like, how should gold behave in this environment? Well, it should be a lot higher, but it's not. It will be. The reason that gold prices are still as low as they are is because I don't think investors understand the situation, just like they didn't understand the situation in the mortgage market. When I was shorting these subprime mortgages, initially, when we first shorted them, they were trading at about 104, 105. You know, they were trading at a premium to what their par was. Now, they, they ultimately went to zero. They, they, they were worthless. But for a period of time, people were willing to pay a premium to buy basically a worthless security. Why? Well, because they didn't know it was worthless. They expected the mortgages to be repaid. Why? Well, because they thought that real estate prices could never go down and that they couldn't lose money. And they also had confidence in the triple B ratings uh, that Moody's or S&P were putting on these securities. I mean, they thought you know they'd get paid. Um, and, and so investors are making the same mistake now in their perception of the value of gold. So with subprime mortgages, market was overvaluing the paper, but with gold, they're undervaluing it. And why? Why don't investors perceive that gold is really worth a lot more than 1800? Because they believe the Fed is gonna be successful in returning inflation to 2%. And so they're pricing gold for an, you know, an, an, a global economy where inflation stays at 2%, you know, as far as the eye can see, as soon as the Fed, you know, you know, gets it right back down there. And they believe that this fight against inflation, as the Fed succeeds in returning inflation to 2%, that this fight is also going to be a negative for the market for gold because it's going to push up the dollar, which is going to hurt gold, right? Rising rates, they say, is bad for gold. So investors believe a bunch of things about the economy and gold, similarly the way they believe a bunch of things about real estate and those subprime mortgages that are gonna turn out to be false. As I said earlier, the Fed is not going to be able to get inflation anywhere near 2%. We are gonna be living in a high inflation environment indefinitely, much, much higher than 2%. And um, we're gonna have negative real interest rates because even with five, six, seven, eight percent interest rates, the inflation rate is going to be above that. So that is a environment where gold should be soaring. And when the price of gold has to get revalued based on a much higher inflationary environment than what the investors now perceive and negative real interest rates, as far as the eye can see, and as investors start to perceive the potential of maybe hyperinflation or inflation not only not returning to 2%, but accelerating to a much higher plane based on all the money that's going to have to be printed to avoid a, a default, which would be even more difficult politically than inflation.
because with inflation, they could always blame it on somebody else. That's why they like to lie and pretend inflation is rising prices rather than an expanding money supply. Prices rise as a result of inflation, but the government likes to pretend that it's the rising prices that are inflation because then they can blame the, the business owners for gouging their customers. They don't have to accept responsibility. But when investors recognize that, wait a minute, inflation is not going to be 2%, it's going to be more like 10% or whatever it is. And now you have to figure out, well, what is a gold and what is an ounce of gold worth today if inflation is going to compound at 10% instead of 2%? Well, what is it worth? $10,000, $15,000? I mean, I don't know. I haven't really done the numbers, but it's worth a lot more than what you think it's worth when you believe inflation is not a threat and is going to stay low. Uh, so at some point, just like when reality hit the subprime market and all of a sudden the bottom dropped out and there were no bids and it went to zero, when the market investors come to the same realization about inflation, then gold's going to soar. There'll be all bids, there'll be no offers. Nobody will want to sell gold at these prices. And the price will go up very quickly. Uh, how high, it's hard to say, but but much higher than it is now. I was going to say, I'm not going to nail you down on a price target for the next 12 months here. But Peter, just in the here and now, like one question I have, like it seems like gold investors try to be smarter than the Fed or try to front run the Fed a little bit when it came to the pivot talk. Gold ran 300 bucks from November to like mid mid January, early or yeah. end of January, and then it sort of dropped, lost complete momentum. Like, what are you predicting shorter term now for for gold to happen here? Uh, it seems like we're waiting for the Fed to make a move. Like, should we prepare for another two three months of malaise in the gold sector, or uh, well, where, where do you see impulses right. coming from? Look, I think there's a lot of support around 1800, so I really wouldn't look for prices to move much lower than that. If they move lower. Um, you know, there is some resistance, probably 1900, 2000 up towards the highs, you know, below 2100. But once we really get above 2100, there is no resistance, right? We're at all time record highs. And I think, you know, you've got clear sailing. Uh, again, it's a question of when is the narrative going to change? Now, I am in the pivot camp. I firmly believe that when push comes to shove, the Fed will pivot, meaning that when the fight against inflation does enough collateral damage to not just the markets, but really the financial system and the economy. When you start to see potential bankruptcies or defaults, when you start to see the beginnings of, or maybe even a financial crisis, because remember the financial crisis of 08 was a result of higher interest rates. That's what pricked the bubble. And the problem was a lot of debt was taken out that couldn't be repaid at higher rates, right? So the same thing is happening now. It's just not concentrated in subprime mortgages. It's just more broad. There's a lot more debt that is non-payable. Uh, but, but the banks that were too big to fail in 2008 are even bigger now. And I think they're even more exposed and they could still fail, except that these banks failing now would have much greater adverse consequences than what the consequences would have been had we let them fail, you know, in 2008, 2009, whatever, whatever that would have been. And so when we get to a breaking point where the Fed has to make a decision between do I keep fighting inflation because it's still above 2 percent or do we try to stimulate the economy because it's imploding? Do I have to bail out these banks? Do we have to bail out uh, hedge funds or what the U.S. government? What if the U.S. government is at a point where it can't make its Social Security payments? You know, it can't make it, it can't pay interest on the debt. It needs the Fed's help. Is the Fed going to provide the help or is the Fed going to tell the government, sorry, we can't help you. Inflation is still 5 percent. We have to keep on doing quantitative tightening. You know, we can't buy any of the bonds. You know, we, you know, you, you just got to default. Right. You know, you got to tell the people on Social Security they can't get their money. You know, so I, I don't think the Fed is going to do that. So the question is when. I think what the markets are finding out is that the pivot is not going to happen as soon as they thought, right? Because the inflation numbers are surprising everybody by how strong they are. Now, it doesn't surprise me because I've been saying the whole time, inflation is not going down. The Fed is not going to cut rates because it wins the battle against inflation. It's going to cut rates despite losing. It's going to surrender because it's going to find another battle that it thinks it's more important to fight. Now, of course, the Fed is going to be wrong. See, you, the mentality at the Fed is still that they can help the economy by stimulating it with lower interest rates or quantitative easing. That doesn't help 
that hurts, right? It's snake oil. <laughs> it, it, all it ever did was kind of disguise the symptoms, kind of like, you know, if you, you break your foot and you're in a football game, let's say you're an athlete and you break your foot and you don't want to play. And so the doctor like shoots it up with some kind of steroid. And now you can keep running because it doesn't hurt you, but the foot is still broken. And now you're running on it and you're making it worse. You just won't know until the Novocaine whatever wears off and now you're, you're in worse shape. And so that's kind of what the Fed does to the economy when they stimulate with cheap money and QE, they just postpone the pain, right? While you allow the problems to get worse, which is what we've done. Because if you actually get right down to it, people talk about all the tools the Fed has to help the economy. They don't have any tools. The Fed wasn't created to help the economy. That's not why we have a Fed but they think they could do it because they have a, a, a magic uh, wand of inflation. That's all the Fed can do is create inflation. And they can, you know, and so they create inflation to try to paper over a problem that they've created. But at this point, inflation has become the problem. And you can't solve an inflation problem with inflation. If your only tool is to create inflation, you can't use that to solve the inflation problem. But when the economy starts to collapse, we have a deep recession, rising unemployment, we have a financial crisis, and the Fed reaches for the only tool that it has, the only tool that it's ever had, which is to create inflation, to try to inflate our way out of the crisis. How is that gonna work when they're doing that at a time when inflation is already high, right? See, when they, when they use that so-called tool after the financial crisis, and they kept using it up until you know 2021, it was because the official inflation rate was still below 2%. And they could say, oh, we need more inflation so we can, we can have this inflationary policy without any adverse consequences. In fact, it's a twofer because we actually need more inflation. Our goal is 2% and we've only got one and a half. So you know, we, we actually need a little bit more inflation. So they were able to make up that BS. But you know, now that inflation is 8% or whatever, they can't say we need more inflation. And so if they decide to deliberately create inflation because there's another problem they're trying to solve, they're gonna make the inflation problem much worse. That's where you get the potential hyperinflation where you completely destroy the value of the dollar, which means you've destroyed the value of US treasuries and all obligations of the US government to pay dollars. Like I'm trying to put a bow around our conversation, stir towards the end, but like one, one thing you haven't mentioned is a word like the financial reset. Right, so it sounds to me like you're you're you're, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, please. The system will continue as is. We'll just go through a massive crisis, and we'll sort of come out at the end just looking the same, more or less. U.S. dollar intact, all of that. There's no hard cut for you, is there? Like like a proper financial reset where somebody says, okay, let's hit the button, let's change this. Maybe CBDCs become introduced, the greenback disappears, and we all go digital. Do you, do you like that's a bit of a, you know. Well, like, uh, if just... we all go digital, and in a way it's digital now, right? I mean, how many paper dollars uh, go through your hands on a typical day? I mean, I, I, I rarely go to the bank anymore. I, you know, it's very rare. I mean, it's usually if I'm just tipping. That's kind of when I give people money. It's like if I make a tip a lot of times, you know, it's $5 bill or something, $10 bill. I mean, usually everything else is on a credit card, right? A debit card, whatever it is, or I do it online, I make a payment. So it's, we're already kind of doing that. But what the move has to be is out of fiat into real money. And that's what I think is going to happen. You know, everybody keeps saying, well, you know, the dollar is going to be the main reserve asset because what's its competition? I mean, are you going to pick the euro? Are you going to pick the yen? Look at all the problems in Europe. Look at the problems in Japan, right? So they, they think we kind of win by default. Well, we're the cleanest dirty shirt in the hamper, right? That's what they say. Well, you know what? There's one shirt that's not in the hamper, right? That's, that's not dirty at all, and that is gold. You know? <laughs> so gold is a credible, viable alternative, not just to the dollar, but to the euro and to the yen and to every fiat currency. And remember, before the dollar became the reserve, gold was the reserve. The entire world was on the gold standard. And it only got on the dollar standard because the U.S. dollar was backed by gold. It was as good as gold. The U.S. government promised to pay gold for its dollar. So that's how we move from gold to the dollar. But once the U.S. defaulted, the world should have just moved back to gold. It didn't. One of the reasons it didn't is because we got the Saudis to start pricing oil in dollars. So now the dollar is kind of backed by oil. 
instead of gold. But you know, now they're, they're, they're moving away from that. Look, Iraq just you now is accepting uh, Chinese yuan uh, for its oil. Uh, but the world is moving away from the petrodollar too. And so I think we're gonna go back to gold. And I think what's going to accelerate the return and remonetization of gold, and it's ironic, but it's gonna be blockchain. You know, because all these Bitcoin guys were saying, oh, Bitcoin is the death of gold. Bitcoin is gold 2.0, right? It's better than gold. No, it's not. It's tulips 2.0. It's got nothing to do with gold. You know what's gold 2.0? Gold on the blockchain, tokenized gold, where instead of transacting in bullion or instead of transacting in paper that's backed by bullion, we transact in digital tokens that are backed by bullion, because now we can send those tokens all the way around the world quickly, cheaply, you know, and so we can conduct commerce using gold. We don't even need silver or copper or nickel anymore because I can break my gold down into tiny little grams and I can use gold for very small transactions. You see, in the past, if you wanted to, you know, do something that was inexpensive, you use silver. You didn't pay in gold. Or you, if it was too uh, cheap for silver, you paid in nickel. Or you used pennies, which were made of copper. You know, so, but now I can buy something for the equivalent of a penny. Not that you can get anything for a penny these days. But I can pay for it with gold because I can take that token and break it up into little tiny you know, increments because that's the magic of the blockchain and, 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 and tokenization. And so... Rather than killing gold, blockchain is going to uh, reinvigorate it with a, a new leash on life. It's going to make it better. Gold is going to be more divisible, more portable, uh, you know, and a better medium of exchange, a better unit of account when it's tokenized on a blockchain than uh, it is, you know, has been in the past when at most it was uh, backing for, for currencies. And, you know, before the governments backed their currencies with gold, private banks backed their notes in gold. In fact, the original paper currencies were issued by blacksmiths that would be storing people's gold. They came up with an IOU. And then instead of running to the blacksmith, every time you wanted to do a transaction, the gold stayed in his safe and, and people just exchanged the note. Right? Well, now you do the same thing instead of a private company issuing a paper note, which, of course, is limited to a physical transaction or, you know, I could put the paper note in, in an envelope and I can mail it. But if I could just have gold in a vault, in a private vault, and then, is then tokenize it and give you the tokens and, and now you can negotiate those and you can use them as a medium of exchange, well, it's much more efficient. That's where I think we're going. I think the biggest obstacle to it is going to be government because government doesn't like competition. And tokenized gold is a huge competition, much more so than Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these, you know, shit coins. Tokenized gold is a real threat to the government's monopoly on, on money. And they don't like that. They, 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 they want this monopoly. They want to be the sole creators. Because if they can create money out of thin air, that gives them all sorts of power, right? They can run these huge deficits. They can be Santa Claus. They can buy elections. They can give voters something without having to tax them to pay for it. Uh, but if they lose that, I mean, that's great for us. I mean, anything that makes it harder for the government to, to tax us and spend is good, right? And so gold is pro-liberty, pro-freedom, pro-prosperity. That's why governments hate it, right? They, they don't want that. It's, it's, it's good for the public but it's bad for governments. And the more corrupt the government is, the worse, the more it hates gold, right? Um, well, Peter, so maybe that, the that's last... the biggest okay. <laughs> threat is that they use anti-money laundering and all that stuff. And they try to say, oh, you can't do this because what about terrorists? What about drug dealers, right? That's what they'll do to try to stop the free market from coming up with a more viable alternative to uh, what governments are, are trying to you know, force on us. On a global scale, there's like five major currencies. If you you know don't take the IMF currency into into account here, do you think the first world currency that's going to get backed by gold will be the new world reserve currency? No, I mean, I don't think there's going to be a new world reserve currency. Again, we don't need a reserve currency. We just need gold, right? Gold is actual money. 
And so gold needs to be at the base of a monetary system. And also, gold is an asset that is not also somebody else's liability. You don't want to give a government that kind of power. Look at what just happened to Russia. And again, I'm not just defending Russia. I'm just using this as an example. But Russia does something that the United States objects to, and it gets sanctioned. It gets punished, and it loses the value of its dollar reserves. It loses access to the SWIFT system that it's been, you know, it's used. And so America is able to punish Russia. Now, that's negative for Russia, right? Because now they got punished. But now what if you're China? It's not like the Chinese are our are, are greatest allies as far as politicians are concerned. I mean, everybody likes to beat up on China. I mean, look at look at how look at what Donald Trump says. And now even, you know, Joe Biden is a big China basher. So I'm I'm in China, right? I'm running China. Do I really want to be beholden if I have this enemy that is also like in charge of my money, in charge of my reserves for my currency? Why would I want to be in that vulnerable position? It's like taking a noose, putting it around your head, and then throwing the other end of it to the United States and hoping they don't pull it. Right? I mean, who wants to put themselves in that position? So I think that we have set a example of why you don't want the dollar as a reserve, but then why would you want the euro? Why would you want the yen? Why would you want some concoction of the IMF? Because now you're beholden to the IMF. They, they, you know, they've got the, 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 the end of that noose that you put around your neck. But if gold is the money, well, then nobody controls that. Nobody, you know, you own gold, you owned it. It's yours. No other government can take it away from you. Exactly. I, I mean, think that's they would have to invade you. They would have to physically invade your country and, and, and get it out of your vault. <laughs> I think own gold is the note we can leave this on. We can, we can end this on. Fantastic. Peter, I tremendously enjoyed our conversation. I was going to ask you, where can we find more? And where, like, But it says shiftgold.com, obviously. And you got the Shift, Shift Radio Show as well. I've listened to a couple episodes of the last few days. Tremendously informative. Appreciate your time. It's great meeting you. Like It's the first time we get to engage here. And uh, all the best. And uh, we'll, we'll, I hope to catch you soon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And buy some gold and silver before the price goes up at Shift Gold. And you know, if you really want to profit from this next bull market in gold, I, I, I like the mining sector, the gold and silver mining stocks. And you know, we manage a lot of accounts at Euro Pacific Asset Management, a gold and silver focused uh, accounts. I also run a mutual fund managed by Adrian Day, the Euro Pacific Gold Fund. And I think we have an incredible portfolio, especially when it comes to the junior miners. And those are the, the stocks that I think have the most upside potential. Of course, it doesn't come without downside risk. So if you're going to invest in the mutual fund, make sure you're comfortable with the risks and, and read the prospectus. But you know, I think that a lot of people are going to get rich off this gold bull market, just like they did in the 1970s. You know, not, most people didn't see that move coming where gold went from $35 an ounce to $850. Uh, but the people who saw it coming uh, were able to make a tremendous amount of money in the mining sector. You couldn't even buy physical gold at the time. It was illegal in the United States, but you could buy gold mining stocks. You know, most of them back then probably South Africa, but you could buy those stocks and the people who did uh, just made an absolute killing. And, and I think history is going to repeat. In fact, I think it, it, the profits could be even bigger this time uh, than last time. And so a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money uh, by high inflation and, and, and financial crisis. But there will be some people, like we talked about the big short, some people made a lot of money in you know the greatest short. Well, I think the greatest short is actually the U.S. dollar. And the best way to short the U.S. dollar and other fiat currencies is to own gold. And I think the way you own the mo make the most money owning gold is own the mining companies that have all the gold in the ground and that generate profits by mining it. Yeah, we should film a part two fairly soon because <laughs> and, and talk about the miners and some of your you know preferred yeah. stocks and names in, in in the sector. Maybe we'll catch up after PDAC. I'll, I'll reach out to you and we'll film part two. All right, fantastic, awesome. Thank you so much, Take Peter, care. and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode with Peter Schiff. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you haven't done so, there's the there's a subscribe button at the bottom left corner here. And uh, I'd love to have you subscribe. Eighty five percent of you are not subscribed to the channel. Really puzzling, and uh, let's make sure to change that. We'll be back with lots, lots more content. Thank you so much.